Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. I am with a very special guest tonight, um, Dr. Dirk de Ritter. Uh, Dr. de Ritter is a Belgian neurosurgeon. He's currently the Neurological Foundation Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of Otago in Dunedin, New Zealand. He spends half his time in New Zealand and half his time in Belgium setting up a dedicated neuromodulation clinic. Dr. de Ritter has published over 250 scientific articles, more than 30 scientific book chapters, and his main research focus is understanding and treating phantom perceptions such as pain and tinnitus, along with addictions using neuromodulation and brain implants. Dr. de Ritter, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good, uh, good evening. Yes, and I guess I, I have to say good afternoon to you since we're uh, in quite the different time zone here. Um, but yeah, I'm very happy to have you on. I, uh, you know, kind of became aware of of some of the the research that you guys are doing um, involving neuromodulation um, and all the specific types that we'll get into in a bit. But um, I really want to uh, touch on that, but. First off, if you could just kind of give me uh, a little bit of an understanding as far as how did you how did you get interested in this field of of neuroscience evolving into becoming a neurosurgeon? Well, it's it's actually very simple. Uh, when I was about four years old, I wanted to become a medical doctor. Of course, I didn't have a clue what different kinds of doctors existed, and then when um, after my high school, I uh, spent about uh, one year in New Mexico as an exchange student, came back, studied medicine in Belgium. And then while doing medicine, I um, thought that uh, the brain was by far the most interesting part of the uh, body. But at that time, there was only two options, either becoming a neurologist, psychiatrist or neurosurgeon. At that time, there was basically no treatments available for neurology. So, by um, and because I'm, um, I want quick solutions. Um, neurosurgery seemed to be by far um, actually the only thing I really wanted to uh, pursue. And that's how I started uh, in neurosurgery. And then within neurosurgery, the um, the surgic, my surgical work is uh, more on skull, bruise, and pituitary surgeries, so it has nothing to do with my research. Um, and that is manually very uh, exciting, but intellectually boring. Um, on the other hand, uh, neuromodulation, which is uh, a form that you can do both non-invasively, going through the skin, but also via implants, um, which is surgically not really exciting, but is uh, intellectually very interesting. So in this way, I've got uh, the best of both worlds. Right, right. So it started with the neurosurgery. And then and what at what point in time did you sort of get interested or become aware of the different neuromodulation techniques? Well, I was um, going to... So I worked for one year in private practice, and then I moved to an academic institution in order to pursue a more academic career. And I was going to write a, a PhD on um, a Darwinian neurosurgical approach uh, for treating tinnitus. Now, while I was doing that, I thought of um, focusing as a neurosurgeon predominantly on microvascular decompressions, one kind of surgery that you can do for tinnitus, but quickly realized that it's actually a rare form of tinnitus and that I would see a lot of other patients with, um, with this phantom percept that also needed a treatment. So I thought, well, then I have to figure out a way of treating all these other patients as well. And being a neurosurgeon, uh, being a neurosurgeon, we tend to simplify things like, well, if we consider tinnitus as uh, overactivity of the auditory cortex, the part of the brain that controls uh, or perceives sound, then that should quiet the tinnitus. And the question was how to do that. At that time, transcranial magnetic stimulation, by which you apply magnetic stimuli, 
through the skin and the skull to the brain was just um, starting to be used. So I um, looked up who in Europe was using transcranial magnetic stimulation, and I found Vincent Walls in, um, in, in Oxford at that time. Uh, went over there, uh, saw how it worked, discussed with him whether we could apply it for tinnitus, and then went with a, with a patient that I saw to, um, to uh, at that time he had moved to London, went to London with the patient where we, um, with the TMS, could suppress the tinnitus uh, transiently. So it seemed to work, and then I... Um, wrote an IRB to go one step further and implant an electrode on the same spot that we use the TMS on. And so I got uh, involved in um, neuromodulation, uh, doing both non-invasive and invasive neuromodulation. At that time, at that time um, some coincidental luck in the sense that there was a billionaire who had tinnitus who wanted to be treated. And um, so he... Um, offered some money so I could develop a research probe on this, um, buying a, my own transcranial magnetic stimulation and all the other um, stimulation devices that you can use. Um, also was able to pay some people to collaborate with in the research unit. So we really got started um, because of that uh, funding and had uh, the possibility to buy the uh, non-invasive tools that were available because the first patient was doing well. Um, there was an American um, implant company at that time. It was called ANS, Advanced Neuromodulation System, who was um, interested in uh, supporting that research as well. So I initially started just uh, treating patients with neuromodulation as a side um, to doing a PhD on another surgical technique for treating uh, the tinnitus. Right. So what, uh, besides uh, tinnitus, what other conditions did you start realizing that neuromodulation had a big effect on or, or could definitely help? Well, what I, so um, when I started using um, neuromodulation, of course, I read up on how uh, tinnitus could um, arise in the brain, and I read the work of uh, Rodolfo Nuss, who um, was basically, and Rodolfo Nuss came uh, up with a theory that uh, tinnitus, pain, Parkinson's disease, depression, and slow wave epilepsy were actually all generated by the same mechanism, which he called thalamocortical dysrhythmia. To, uh, to make it simple, what it means is that the normal um, firing or oscillation rate in the brain slows down. And because of this slowing down, there is um, less inhibition on the surrounding area, which then becomes hyperactive. So normal active is replaced by a combination of low frequency and high frequency activity. And because it seemed to work in tinnitus, at least in some patients at that time, um, we um, said, well, for patients with non-treatable or intractable uh, pain, we can do the same thing. We can just go to the somatosensory cortex. So we just use magnet stimulation to see if the patients respond to the stimulation. And if they respond, then we can um, implant an electrode on that part of the brain. Now, later on, um, we, um, I got interested in trying to understand why some uh, patients do not respond uh, to, the, um, to the stimulation and the implants. And because of that, I, I read about um, uh, somebody's work who was talking about allostasis, meaning that uh, the brain creates a new reference. And basically, the painful state or the reference state becomes the norm. It becomes part of who you are. And um, then if you try to, to change or modulate that, actually, the brain will just reset to its own reference, which is the painful state. And uh, so even, this was well studied. 
So even if uh, whatever, if, if it's a pain uh, state, even if the uh, the injury that's causing the pain, even if that has been recovered, is it what you're saying that basically the brain can kind of get um, kind of programmed to continually respond to that pain, even when, when the pain has actually been resolved in the body? Yes, yes because because after um, a while the pain basically considered that uh, the pain is just part of um, of the normal self representation right and so the the painful uh, normally pain is an external stimulus but then pain becomes uh, generated by the brain itself and the painful state becomes linked to your self representational state which is active when you daydream when you mind wander etc so because of that, this, this reference resetting was studied alcohol addiction. And, um, for example, if somebody uh, drinks, uh, feels depressed and drinks uh, one or two glasses of wine in order to feel less depressed, then uh, after a while that patient needs to drink more and more and more to get the same effect. And ultimately, um, the effect even wears off, even if the patient drinks tons of, um, of alcohol. So this reference resetting uh, then brought me to New Zealand where I wanted to study this uh, reference resetting in food and alcohol addiction. And um, so since then, we've also implanted patients with, um, with alcohol addiction um, in an area that we think is part of the circuit that does the reference um, resetting. So that's um, that one, a logical next step of um, of trying to um, uh, treat other pathologies and and the goal and the goal was still the same is to use uh, first non-invasive stimulation and if that works transiently but not long lasting then you you uh, switch to um, an implant. However, if with non-invasive stimulation you can have an effect, let's say that lasts for nine or ten months, then you just um, as the patient to come back every year for um, for a, a time of non-invasive stimulation. So it's only for those people who cannot be treated with with non-invasive neuromodulation. Mm -hmm. And as far as the the non-invasive neuromodulation goes, you know, there's there's different forms of it for people who aren't aware. You know, you have the the transcranial direct current, the alternating current, random noise. Um, pink noise. So can you just give like a brief um, kind of description of maybe, you know, what these different uh, simulations are, are doing to the brain and then what specifically they can really help out for? So basically, um, so on the one hand, uh, we've talked about uh, magnetic stimuli that you apply to the brain, and then there is a second group of uh, non-invasive uh, stimulation, which is called transcranial electrical stimulation. Now, electricity can be applied in different forms. One is direct current. Direct current is uh, basically like a car battery, where you have um, current flowing from the anode to the, uh, to the cathode of which 50% goes to the skin and uh, through the skin and then 50% probably through the brain. Uh, what that does is under the anode, the, the cells get more excitable, get closer to firing threshold, so they become ready to respond. Whereas under the cathode, you've got the opposite effect. So if you have a part of the brain that's over and you want to quiet it down, then you uh, put an cathode over that area if there is an area of the brain that is not active enough and you want to make it more active that put an anode of that part of the brain i mean this is a little bit of a simplified version but that's the, the basic concept with alternating current that's just like the electricity that you have in your house or where your laptop runs on um, so there the current uh, switches between positive and negative um, and the idea there is that you can train the brain oscillations or the brain uh, to follow that rhythm. This hasn't been really been very successful clinically um, up to now, uh, probably because you have to synchronize the activity of the alternating current uh, to the frequency of the brain. And so this is uh, technically more uh, demanding and therefore it is, it's not really used all that often. 
uh, what um, what we prefer most and what I believe in most is um, is different kinds of electrical noise stimulation. So the the elect the electricity is delivered in a kind of a chaotic way. It's not purely chaotic because there is a structure to it. Um, in in white noise, well, it's purely chaotic. And we have developed pink noise stimulation because that mimics how the electricity in our brain is um, functioning itself. And this seems to be um, to be better in um, in uh, creating a brain that is not um, hypersynchronous. So a lot of um, pathologies now that we know are caused by um, hypersynchrony so parts of the brain that talk too much to each other and one way of trying to um, suppress this um, over communication in the brain is by um, injecting noise to those parts of the brain that are actually talking too much to each other so it's not active of one part but it's a network that is overactive and this seems to respond uh, better to noise so we once did a study where we compared um the the different kinds of noise so direct current alternating current and noise stimulation in tinnitus patients um injecting the noise to the auditory cortex and the only one that was really beneficial was the noise stimulation so noise seems to be um, at least in our experience better than the other kinds of um of stimulation and this hypo co or uh, hyper coherence rather that we're talking about yep. is this the uh, thalamic cortical dysregulate uh, dysrhythmia that we mentioned earlier uh, is that no but in, in but what you can do what you um, so in thalamocortical dysrhythmia is characterized by uh, a common core that all the thalamocortical dysrhythmias have in common and that is that um, in the anterior singlet cortex and the parahippocampus, um, so two two parts of the brain are overactive, and um, then they are connected to different uh, parts of the brain, so the auditory cortex and tinnitus. Uh, and if the same core is connected to the motor cortex, uh, you get Parkinson symptoms. If the same core is connected to the somatosensory cortex, you get neuropathic pain. And if the same core is connected to the auditory cortex, you get tinnitus. So the core has to be um, is over connected to um, to those um, other yes. And this is what you try to uh, break this over connectivity, so that even though the core might still be active, you take away the the connection and therefore the symptom. And so the thalamocortical dysrhythmia is. Uh, it seems to really exist uh, because we've used some machine learning in order to see whether we could detect that. So the way uh, we did this, we, we created a model of how tinnitus is generated. And then we um, um, gave some new EEGs, so brain activity, to that um, machine, to the computer. Uh, to see how accurately it could detect whether thalamocortical dysrhythmia was present or not. Uh, we achieved uh, close to 90% accuracy for tinnitus pain, uh, Parkinson's disease, um, and depression. So it, it does really seem to exist because that was purely um, um, based on data and not on any uh, pre-assumptions that we, that we might have had that could influence the data. So the, the question then is, uh, what uh, what can we develop further to get better results? And this is what we're now uh, collaborating with Neuroelectrics, which is um, Ansoterics, uh, two companies um, that develop those non-invasive uh, transcranial electrical stimulations. And um, we're developing still new stimulation designs, ultimately always with the same goal, is to try and communicate to the brain language it understands better which is its own language so we mimic normal brain activity and normal brain connectivity um, in order to get a result okay and then uh so what percentage of the patients um that that 
you're looking at, you know, who have tinnitus or pain uh, or Parkinson's that you had mentioned, how many of them uh, are, are displaying this thalamocortical dysrhythmia? Well, and um, and so considering that we have an accuracy of uh, about uh, eighty-five, well, except for uh, depression where it's a little less, but considering that we have about eighty percent accuracy in detecting uh, the tinnitus because of the thalamocortical dysrhythmia, I assume about eighty-five to ninety percent of the patients do have the thalamocortical dysrhythmia. Uh, not everybody. Uh, because thalamocortical dysrhythmia is generated by uh, deafferentiation, which means a lack of sensory input. So, for example, hearing loss in patients with tinnitus or um, uh, an amputated limb in patients with uh, or or this, uh, damaged nerve in patients with uh, with pain. So that is a trigger for the thalamocortical dysrhythmia. But some patients also have without any damage to the nervous system. Um, for example, fibromyalgia patients, what they have is a lack of um, pain suppression. So to simplify it conceptually, pain is a balance between pain input and pain suppression. If you have more input and the suppression is, um, is not sufficient, then you, have, then you are in pain. But you can also actually get pain without more input, but just the decrease in, in, in spontaneous suppression. So what it means is that we constantly are all in pain, but that we suppress it. So that if you take away, um, if you take away the break, then you will feel pain. And that's why in fibromyalgia, it's also generalized pain. The pain is everywhere in the body because the break um, of the pain doesn't work. So you, you, you feel pain everywhere. So those patients do not have thalamocortical dysrhythmia, but another mechanism that creates an imbalance. And this imbalance is probably not just present in pain, but also in, um, in, other, in other pathologies like tinnitus or vertigo, et cetera. Right. So, and then as far as the, the idea behind using the pink noise, so if, if I'm understanding you correctly, the pink noise will kind of disrupt these areas of the brain that are that are communicating too much, this hypercoherence. So, if say there's a, a pain signal that is getting sent, um, even when it shouldn't be sent, if there's no longer pain, can this pink noise basically interrupt that signal and kind of restore proper brain function in that way in those networks? Yes, and, and so this is what we're currently testing. Um, in, in, uh, in patients. So we've, we've tested the pink noise already in patients with uh, addiction, where we know there is overactivity and overconnectivity usually, but not always, but usually from um, the anterior cingulate, basically the area in the brain that um, creates craving. And so what you could see is that uh, by, um, by uh, suppressing the activity and the connectivity that you actually see a decrease in raving because of the pink noise. You can also try to get that from um, with suppressing that part because if, if it is overactive, then the suppression, uh, you can also, for example, use um, cathodal um, TDCS to suppress uh, those uh, hyperactive. But the, the noise is, is basically, um, the goal is to, to normalize communication, but also to normalize the normal activity in the brain because it mimics what it should normally be. Um, and so you superimpose it on whatever is, is, um, is going on. And therefore, it um, seems to be the most physiological because you mimic normal brain activity. Interesting. Okay, so we talked about kind of the, the non-invasive approach um, that you might start out with, but say this stuff isn't working and you move on to, to the, the kind of brain implants that I think you briefly touched on um, and that I had read a little about your work on. Can you tell me kind of what, uh, what conditions and kind of what areas of the brain that, that you would actually be working on there? 
So uh, most of my initial research was on tinnitus. So we've implanted um, electrodes uh, predominantly on the auditory cortex, but um, also um, we started realizing that it did not work in, um, in, um, in everybody. Um, and then there was two solutions to that problem. One solution was to see whether we could not change the stimulation design, so the way which, in which we communicate with the brain. And the other one was whether, we might, whether it might not be the right target. So what we uh, did for the first is we developed burst stimulation, which is basically um, a burst uh, firing. Burst firing in the brain is an electrophysiological signal that says this is important. So um, when we applied that to the auditory cortex, we could actually rescue 50% of the people who failed stimulation, but that meant there was still 25% who were not responding. So we then um, uh, looked at brain activity, the difference between those people who responded to the implant and those who did not respond to the implant. And what we found there was that um, the patients who did not respond actually had uh, abnormal activity in the parahippocampal area, which is one of the two areas of the thalamocortical dysrhythmia core. And um, this part is um, very important for contextual memory. So the idea was that those patients would actually pull the tinnitus sound from memory and that we had to get access to that memory spot. So we implanted uh, two patients on the, the, on the parahippocampal area, but um, unfortunately they did not respond for um, reasons that were not very clear. Um, maybe also because we didn't use the right stimulation design or the electrodes were not on the perfect part of the parahippocampal area, which is a fairly large area. So that, that could be a, a possibility. Um, was there a concern in that case that, that that might distort other memories just besides the trying to get rid of the, the sort of impression of the uh, tinnitus? So, yeah, so, well, actually, before we uh, implanted the patients, what we did is um, we would uh, go in with a little catheter um, all the way into the uh, uh, blood vessel in the brain that supplies the uh, the parahippocampus with blood and then we would inject barbitol which is uh, like a sleeping tablet and then so we would put that uh, the parahippocampus to sleep and we would implant only those patients who would respond to that so where we knew okay well if we put that part of the brain to sleep um, and the tinnitus is improved then it's worthwhile to go um, and implant the, uh, the electrode uh, when you put the entire hippocampus uh, to sleep, yes, you, you can have uh, um, uh, some confusion in the patients, but um, that is, of course, because you, you, you put the entire uh, hippocampus and entire hippocampus to sleep, whereas with an electrode, you're, you're way more specific. This advantage of being very uh, focal is that you might miss the target, of course. Um, and the but the benefit is that you don't get true side effects and so we didn't see any side effects but unfortunately it uh, it did benefit a patient one of the two patients for a short time but um, it didn't last so it's still an avenue that we have to pursue in the future um, but we're um, first trying to see if we cannot come up with um, with a stimulator that can generate, for example, this pink noise that could uh, disrupt the connectivity between the para, uh, hippocampus and the auditory cortex, because we've seen that in those patients who do not re respond to the auditory cortex implant, it is because they're too much connected to the auditory memory part of the brain. And so therefore the, the, the noise would be the theoretically at least the ideal um, stimulation design but uh, we have not yet found a company um, that is capable of developing the, the pink noise stimulation for an implantable device so in the future i want to go back to that um, that target uh, once we have the equipment that allows us to do it so in some patients it's also the the frontal 
cortex which is important and so um, using the same technology um, TMS if we if we saw we had benefits on the on the frontal cortex that that could reduce the tinnitus we um, we implanted the patients there we also went to the anterior singlet also for tinnitus um, and interestingly also there we saw that uh, patients with with abnormal connectivity were the ones that um, with over connectivity um, would somewhat respond uh, with not enough connectivity would not respond so therefore we have to develop yet another stimulation design that can increase connectivity between um, two areas which is possible but then you need to implant two electrodes between the two areas that are um, not enough connected so it, it just makes it a little bit more um, more difficult and that's why we are currently testing this non-invasively uh, because of the very uh, new designs um, which are being developed by neuroelectrics and satirics are, are capable of stimulating more than one area simultaneously and so you can induce synchrony just like in heavy plasticity where cells that fire together will wire together so that we could use uh, or we can try to develop new connections uh, between different parts of the brain that are not uh, sufficiently connected. So, um, so all these new uh, technologies, of course, need to be developed based on what is um, currently available in the neuroscience literature, which is predominantly uh, for people like me, depending on the functional imaging such as uh, fMRI or EEG um, MEG etc mm -hmm. and then can, can you just walk me through a little bit about so when you do these brain implants you're putting an electrode or, or in some cases I guess two electrodes at specific regions of the brain and then how how do they get the stimulation or, or what after the surgery is finished yeah. or the, the implantation is finished, what is going on? So uh, basically the implantation itself is not very difficult. You have a neuro navigation machine, which is a GPS that tells you exactly where you have to be, just like your GPS tells you where you, ha where you have to drive. So there are, there are GPS systems that tell us exactly where we have to, to place the electrode based on functional imaging. So for example, you do an fMRI where you worsen the pain in a patient, then you see where on the somatosensual cortex that, uh, that uh, which area is overactive. That's where you target the TMS and then you just make a small uh, craniotomy, so um, um, a hole in the skull. And then we actually, for most of the cortex, this is the electrode even not directly on the brain, but outside the dura, which is a, a soft covering of the brain, so as certainly not to damage the brain then you just put the, the bone back and initially we uh, we connect the electrode to an extension cable that comes out uh, of the skin so we can test it um, externally and then if that works then we use uh, a modified pacemaker actually to connect it to the electrode and then the pacemaker can be programmed to deliver electrical stimuli in the way you want it um, so Ultimately, the, the, the implants are just a modification of the classical pacemaker uh, that is uh, adapted to stimulating brain or spine or peripheral nerves. Now, when the patient doesn't feel when you stimulate the brain, so you can, um, you can then program this, um, this pacemaker so that it uh, stimulates periods on, periods off. And it's important to, do, to not constantly stimulate because otherwise you will uh, induce uh, seizures. So if you stimulate on and off, you don't have that risk. Um, and then you just uh, basically program and reprogram um, the pacemaker until you find a stimulation pattern that uh, benefits the patient. So that can be very um, labor intensive uh, because you uh, you have to to program. Then if the ten, if 
the pain goes away, then sometimes the pain can come back because the, the brain habituates to the stimulation, just like you don't feel your clothes because it's always the same stimulus. If it's always the same for the brain, it's completely irrelevant and not important. So it suppresses that input. But that seems to occur as well with the implants. So then you have to kind of circumvent that by either giving a more chaotic stimulation, that's where the noise again becomes very interesting, or you have a multiple program that you can run one one after the other so the brain cannot predict when the next stimuli are going to arrive. And therefore we, uh, we try to prevent that the brain habituates to the stimulation. Um, Considering that the patients don't feel that stimulation, it, it makes it also easy um, for them because the stimulator can be on without them having any abnormal experiences um, of it. But, but unfortunately, any kind of stimulation with implants that you do has um, about, on average or long term, 50% uh, symptom improvement and 50% of the patients. So there is still a huge margin for improvement. And this is why there is a lot of uh, research now being done on how we can um, improve um, the outcomes of the, of the patients who finally undergo neurosurgery and then do not get um, the expected benefit. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, I don't know how, how much different, um, you know, this kind of, uh, uh, these implants are in, in European medicine, but I'm curious, just kind of in, in the U.S. Or, or in other places of the world, at what stage, I mean, it seems like a lot of this stuff is, is currently in the research phase, but when is this going to be something that's regularly done where people just are getting brain implants when when they come in to a doctor or they see a neurosurgeon you know with complaints of of chronic uh tinnitus or, or chronic pain how how far away do you think we are from that well actually uh, um, it is currently uh, routinely done for patients with movement disorders like tremor and parkinson's disease um, there is studies going on uh, for depression um, that uh, where people who, who do not respond to any medication or uh, psychological treatments could get uh, or TMS or they respond, but only for a short time uh, to TMS would be um, candidates. So basically people who've had every possible treatment um, could go for uh, depression, but that is not yet uh, the only FDA approved uh, or CE mark. The only thing that is approved is, uh, is mood disorders. Now, um, the, uh, all the rest is still uh, in a research um, uh, setting. And one of the, the big problems, exactly the same as in the pharma industry, is that uh, once you, if you do an open label pilot study, they, for one or another reason, they, there it seems to work with, with good outcomes. But once you go to the placebo controlled uh, rigid studies, for one or another reason, whether it's with medication or with uh, with implants, um, the outcomes are are not as good as with the open label studies. In an open label study, basically everybody gets re-emulation and you don't compare it to anything. You just see is somebody improving or not. That's it. Which for the patient ultimately is the only thing that's really important. Do I get better or not? But from a scientific point of view, you really want to prove that it is better than doing nothing or than stimulating and then um, the effect seems to um, seems to diminish for reasons that we do not understand very well yet um, and so this is where um, basically people are are not getting the, the expected outcomes and therefore uh, it does not become reimbursed yet. But interestingly, for example, pain uh, was one of the first indications for uh, deep brain stimulation or um, cortex stimulation. Uh, and, it, and it works well, but only for a couple of months. And then after a couple of months, 
the the, the benefit seems to um, seems to be lost. One of the reasons is what we discussed earlier on is the tank. Um, the, the brain habituates to the stimulation because the current stimulators can only do a fixed set of stimuli that come very in a regular way and therefore the brain just says well this, stim this stimulus is very it's always the same it can't have any importance and therefore I ignore it ultimately because the pain has become part of the self image uh, if the pain is uh, if the pain has become part of the self image then if it suppresses uh, the stimulus that is supposed to um, to inhibit the pain then the pain comes back so that's um, one of um, one of the main reasons why i i i'm i'm still trying already for now uh, close to uh, 10 years to uh, convince a company to develop this uh, noise noisy waveform because i think it can prevent this um, this situation now we can test it already um, since a year with um, with those non-invasive stimulators. This uh, and therefore, um, if we get beneficial results there, it might be easier to convince somebody to um, to build it also for implants. Um, so yes, the 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 future is not just in in understanding better what we do, but also in in a better communication and. Uh, in order to get better outcomes, and only then will we get uh, uh, more indications where, as you said, routinely patients will go to the doctor and they say, well, you've tried medication, you've tried um, psychological treatment, tried whatever you could. Um, let's try non-invasive stimulation. If that works, we'll, uh, but not long enough. We go ahead and um, an implant and in, in a more routine uh, and more routine way. Mm -hmm. but time will. It seems, at least with modern psychiatry in the U.S., that you know some psychiatrists or psychologists are starting to integrate you know EEGs and and brain mapping the you know QEEGs um, as part of their practice. But I'm curious as far as you know, do you think that neuromodulation and some of these other things we've uh, we've talked about do you think those sort of need to be, there needs to be kind of more interconnection between people, you know, coming in with, with psychological, um, psychiatric complaints? Because it seems like there's a lot of promise that a lot of these different forms of, of stimulation or even potentially implants in, in real severe cases could be, you know, potentially life-changing. Yes. So in some countries like Belgium, for example, um, you can implant for uh, obsessive compulsive disorders or for depression or for anorexia if it's a severe uh, case uh, after this has been discussed in a national psychosurgery committee and if the committee says yes then you're ethically allowed to implant those patients there is a, another reason why uh, in the future I think neuromodulation uh, non-invasive or invasive will become uh, more and more um, uh, predominant in uh, psychiatric and psychological disorders is that the pharma industry has stopped developing those products um, that should uh, improve those disorders because um, they are um, they have fifty percent less chance of uh, making it to the market in comparison to drugs for heart or cancer. Um, they are they take thirty times thirty percent longer to develop and they um, they cost 30% 30, 30 more. So the big pharma is not interested in, develop, uh, in developing uh, neuropharmacological medications anymore. So this gap needs to be filled and neuromodulation is going to fill that gap because of the better understanding of how the brain works and because um, slowly but certainly psychiatrists uh, become uh, convinced that it could be an option. Of course, we there is a problem of the um, the psychosurgery um, that happened in the in the in the 40s and the 50s, um, and that uh, still has to be um, taken into consideration. That that uh, puts a break on a lot of people psychologically, um, but the. Um, 
making a lesion is very different from uh, trying to uh, to uh, modify brain activity by uh, neuromodulation because that is reversible. Just like if the drug is stopped, then the, uh, once the drug wears out, normally the effect is gone. Similarly, um, if if you if you do an implant and um, you would see well, there is a benefit, but the side effects are far worse than the benefit, then you can always stop stimulation in the worst scenario. Or you can, of course, first look for um, uh, other stimulation designs that might keep the same benefit, but not have uh, the side effects. Uh, but if, if all fails, you can still stop, and then it is as if you haven't done anything. So from a practical point of view, this... Um, this uh, fear of um, interventions into the brain and psychiatric disease, I think, with the current state of knowledge, is not um, uh, should should not be there anymore. Mm -hmm. And the future of psychiatry is going to be neuromodulation uh, with non-invasive and invasive forms. Interesting. And then I'm curious as far as do you do you see any kind of synergy um, with other sort of integrative approaches um, to, to improving brain functioning, whether that be um, changes in diet or exercise, sleep? Um, do you think that affects the, the success of neuromodulation in any way or are they kind of unrelated? Um, well, there, there, this has been very little researched, uh, but there is some people, including ourselves, who now start thinking that actually, uh, yes, using a combined approach might be beneficial. So um, you can, you can. Uh, there is a couple of theories that uh, that suggest, for example, that Alzheimer's disease is um, caused by excited toxicity. So basically, the brain is hyperactive. Because it over, it's overactive, it creates waste products, and the waste products are actually causing an inflammatory response, and this inflammatory response causes more damage, and so you get into a vicious circle where the brain ultimately kind of kills it, itself by being over um, overactive. So if that is um, the case, then you can, of course, try to quiet down the brain, or uh, and or you can supplement uh, the brain by giving it uh, better nutrition. Um, for example, um, well, a lot of those uh, nutritionals that are being given. And so the does not uh, exclude the other. And I think in the future, even though we n currently have no evidence for it, it might be applied more. Uh, another practical example is... Um, for depression, for example, um, people now use the, um, ketamine um, subcutaneously or intravenously and, and soon uh, uh, intranasal ketamine. Yeah. Um, the problem with that is that the product works. If it works, it's, it works like a miracle. Uh, people who have been depressed for years are not depressed within an hour or an hour and a half. The problem is it only works for about a week and then the effect wears off. So, so th therefore you might see in the future that we will combine giving ketamine to get a very rapid improvement and then maintain the beneficial effect by using neuromodulation. So an add-on effect. And that sense you could also conceive in the future um, that you would add some uh, medication, um, so, uh, some nutritionals that, um, for example, essential amino acids, because your neurotransmitters need those in order to be functioning normally, um, or um, tryptophan if you want to modify your serotonin levels, etc. So that in the future we go to a more holistic approach where we combine medication with neuromodulation and nutrition. The problem is to prove scientifically that it is better to do the combination than to do just one of, of the three things we just mentioned, medication or modulation or, um, or n nutrition. So uh, the combination is, uh, intuitively makes sense. And I think a lot of people uh, will will go for that automatically, um, but and this is where it's always the a little bit of the problem between 
the clinician, the doctor who treats the patient and wants to get something better, and the scientist who says, yes, but we first have to know whether it really works or not. Um, there is always a, a fight there, uh, but ultimately, as a medical doctor, you're responsible for the patient to improve the patient. And it's not because it has not been proven yet that it does not work. So saying, well, this hasn't been proven, so it cannot work is, rub is nonsense. Mm -hmm. Some things work, we just have not, they have not been proven yet. And so uh, often clinicians will see that something seems to work in their patients. So they pick up, their brain picks up a pattern that if they give um, X, Y, or Z as medication, that it seems to be better. And then often the scientists come afterwards and then try and prove or disprove whether that is correct or not. Um, but so the, the current uh, way of all governments in the world, where they only want to fund what is scientifically proven, I think is going in the wrong direction. It's good for saving money, but it's not good from a healthcare perspective. People should be treated. Um, and if a doctor has experience and says, look, this in my hands seems to make a patient better, then I think that's more important for society that people are better than that it is scientifically 100% certain uh, how how it makes people better and, and why it makes people better. Ultimately, people need to be treated. Um, and if we only fund what has been, then you can stop most of neurosurgery because most of neurosurgery has never underwent placebo-controlled trials. Um, we just do it because we assume by experience that that's the best way of treating a patient. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So I'm curious, as far as, you know, we, we talked a lot about kind of um, these neuromodulation techniques um, and implants for, for disorders, for, for people with kind of, you know, brains that need some recovery in, in one sense or another. But what about neuromodulation for peak performance or for athletics? Where do you see that headed? I mean, is, is it going to eventually become something like, you know, where just as, you know, it's pretty common for, for us to have exercise regimens, you know, are there going to be, you know, uh, are we all going to have neurostimulation units in our homes and, and exercise our brains in the same way we do our bodies? Like what, where do you see the future of that headed? Well, neuro enhancement, of course, uh, is being used already by lots of uh, people who perform sports, uh, peak performance, uh, especially neurofeedback training, seems to be um, on the forefront of, uh, of trying to people, of trying to help people, especially control stress and then uh, thereby perform better in, in, in very stressful moments, whether that is in a in a, in a board of a company um, who has to make uh, some critical de uh, decisions or whether it is in the, in the domain of sports. Um, so what neurofeedback has as a neuromodulation technique uh, as an advantage over other um, techniques like magnetic stimulation or electrical stimulation is that it really uh, trains your brain, it teaches the brain something. Ultimately, um, giving a, a stimulation, whether it's magnetic or electrical, doesn't teach your brain anything. But neurofeedback is based on operant conditioning. So basically, um, you um, to, to put it simple, if, if it's EG, you put an EG cap on. Um, we, we tell what uh, should be the good activity and what part of the brain. And then um, if your brain which is constantly changing an activity hits the right uh, the right frequency in the right part of the brain then you get a, uh, a reward so that reward could be a little movie that continues playing on your television or a green light or a bar that goes up but it doesn't really matter as long and interestingly your brain picks up the correlation between its own activity and the reward and therefore is trained to function to function in a, in a better or optimal way you can use that to treat people, but also to enhance 
your own um, um, efforts. The problem with neurofeedback is that until very recently, um, the research that was done in neurofeedback was not of very high quality. And um, so it's, it's uh, but last uh, four, four to five years, we see that um, even in the neurofeedback field, that actually uh, people uh, also do placebo controlled studies to really show how it works. And I think that in the future, yes, um, more and more people will get access to these um, to this technology. Uh, what it needs to what it needs to do is to uh, be basically more easy to use uh, because currently, I mean, you can do neurofeedback training via the internet, uh, but you still have to have um, EG cap with gel on your and on the electrodes, etc. So in the future. Once, for example, we will have dry electrodes, which means you just put on a cap and that's it. Right. Uh, and the and the protocols become automated, so you automatically get the feedback to work. Then, of course, it will become way more easy for somebody to buy a device and say, okay, well, I'll uh, in the evening, uh, instead of drinking a glass of red wine, which calms me down, I will just uh, put on my cap and get some... Um, brain um, exercise or whether it's a relaxing exercise or uh, whether it's um, uh, enhancing uh, specific uh, circuits in the brain that are related to uh, relaxation, etc. It doesn't really matter, but the future, I think, will go in that, uh, in that direction where we will become more and more um, integrating or we will integrate more and more um, information about the brain and um, how to respond and uh, this brain computer interfaces which which is just another name for the same thing is where a lot where um, big companies like google and facebook but also the uh, darpa so the american military etc is putting in a or Neuralink uh, by you know must mm -hmm. is putting in lots of money decode the brain um, activity into thoughts, into uh, percepts, whether it's pain or tinnitus, that's in the pathological domain, but also in the non-pathological domain. So the fact that there is this, uh, this huge interest, this kind of race going on for decoding brain activity clearly shows that, uh, that the future is going to be in, um, in integrating uh, these electronics that pick up brain activity with uh, with responses to control the brain activity. Right, right. And it's interesting you mentioned uh, the the military. I had seen uh, there's like a DARPA, the the U.S. military. There's like a, a TDCS montage that they've found that doubles learning speed um, in snipers um, that they've proven. You know, so I mean it. It makes sense. I mean, that, that the military that sports all of these different, um, you know, domains would, would be interested in enhancing human performance, enhancing brain performance. So I, I'm super curious, you know, where, you know, the future ends up taking us in that regard. So, well, the future is going to be um, uh, the integration of artificial intelligence, uh, which basically is pattern recognition. And once the artificial intelligence will be able to recognize more those patterns of brain activity and connectivity, um, then if, if we can understand those better, then we also know how to better control them. And that, of course, will lead to peak performance, whether it's uh, as a sniper or as a, as a, as a sportsman mm -hmm. or as a student um, who wants to, who has to learn lots in a short time frame. Ultimately, we will... Um, we will be uh, optimizing our brain function uh, by uh, by this technology, and I think it's it's ultimately going to be um, probably better than students taking uh, modafinil or um, ritalin, um, which uh, which might have more side effects in the long run than um, than training your brain. 
just like you train your muscles. doesn't mean that we all have to be uh, bodybuilders, the brain, but for some people, it might be uh, beneficial for, uh, depending on what your, um, what your job or what your hobbies. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. DeRitter, for coming on the podcast today. Um, do you have any resources that uh, anywhere you want to direct people to who are curious to find out more about your work? Uh, no, but I am currently uh, writing a book which uh, apparently is unreadable. So my partner, who's a writer, is going to translate it now in more um, um, uh, understandable language. So I hope that uh, maybe next year it, um, it uh, should be finished and then uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can publish that. It will summarize uh, a lot of what we do and, and uh, also where we will be going in the future. Uh, for now, there is all the, the scientific publications and some, um, some talks on, on YouTube, but uh, not, uh, nothing yet that really summarizes everything. Right on. Well, I'm looking forward to the book. So it's, it's kind of a book for more for explaining these complex topics, more for sort of lay people or? Yes. Yes, it's, gotcha. uh, it's written specifically for the lay people because I think it's important that the people not be afraid of all uh, these advances in, in brain science, but, uh, but rather embrace them. And as long as we as uh, brain um, scientists and uh, implanters are open and clear and, and say, look, this is what we do uh, and explain what we do, I think if people understand it better, there will be less fear of this uh, evolution that is going to come anyway. Well said. Awesome. Well, if you guys enjoyed the podcast today, go ahead and like and subscribe on YouTube. Our channel is Roscoe's Wetsuit. On Instagram, we're uh, Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. And you can also find the audio version of the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Dr. DeRitter, again, thank you so much for coming on tonight. It was uh, a pleasure.